Well, church family, listen, I'm going to ask you right now, uh, in my absence, uh, why don't you stand to your feet, and I'll read through the scriptures, and um, you'll stand with me, but I'll read through, and we'll honor God's word together. This is now part four of our message titled, Under the Shadow of the Almighty, and I can't help but think that that comfort and that assurance of that great word, Under the Shadow of the Almighty, uh, will be very, very prophetic for us all uh, in the next few days. Romans chapter 11, I'll pick it up uh, reading verse 11 now. And the Apostle Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, that is the fall of Israel, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to us, right? Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, or when they come back, their completeness. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. So Paul wants to see some of his Jewish brothers and sisters receive Yahshua as Hamashiach, Jesus as Messiah. And he says there that in verse 15, for if their being cast away or set aside is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, that would be Israel, the lump, that's all Gentiles, is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 17, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive branch, that's us Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But listen, if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And we're going to stop here. Uh, ultimately, this argument runs all the way down to verse, four, verse 24, but we're going to stop right here at this. And for those of you who are your faithful note takers, uh, remember this. Under the shadow of the Almighty, we have learned this, that it is where God desires you and I to see beyond. That was number one. Number two is that under the shadow of the Almighty, we have that perspective. We have that look, uh, that opportunity to understand this, that it's where God desires you and I to be unburdened. We talked about that last week. And then we also talked about this last week as well. That was found in verses 11 to 12, and that is where God desires you and I to be satisfied. So under the shadow of the Almighty is God's word to the nation of Israel. And he told them throughout the entire Old Testament economy, I will protect you. I will watch over you. I will shelter you. And you would think, well, Jack, history doesn't reveal that. God must have failed. Oh no, my friend, listen everybody, God never failed. Israel failed in believing the word of God and they began to go after other pursuits. Sound familiar? Listen, we must glean from this study in the book of Romans chapter 11 that we do not depart from our God, that we do not let things rob us and bring us into that place of unbelief. So church, we pick it up in our study today. Look at your Bibles, notepads open, getting ready to write this down. Number four is this, under the shadow of the Almighty, verses 13 to 16 is where God desires you to be secured. Secured. Please write down that word secured. God desires every single one of us to be secured as a believer. What does that mean? What does that mean and how can we experience that as, as people in this crazy day and age? Well, my friends, uh, the fact of the matter is this. In verses 13 and 14, this is what we learn, and, and I want to really stress this. It says in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm apostle to the Gentiles. He says, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, that is my Jewish brothers and sisters, and this is his intent, this is his goal, to save some of them. He's looking at it realistically, and he's understanding not everyone who's invited, not everyone who is 
preach to will respond to the gospel. You may be here today and you've heard preaching, you've heard evangelism all your life, but you've never become a believer. Well, listen, we just want those to hear the word of God. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me and they'll respond. Out of this crowd that you're in right now, most, I would say, in this crowd are believers. They're followers of Christ. Some of you are weighing it out, thinking about it. Out of that group, there's a handful of you that may very well become followers of Jesus today. And we need to remember that. We need to think about that. But why should we do that? Why is that important? Well, look at verse 13. And this is what we learn. We are secured by His atonement. Under the shadow of the Almighty is where God wants you and I to experience His security and His assurance. But how does that happen? It happens by His atonement. You see, Jack, what's the word atonement? His atonement is what Christ did at the cross. We talked a lot about that last week. Atonement is this. There's something terribly wrong. There's something that is terribly amiss. And there's no way out of it because all of us who are in this group of finding out, oh my goodness, how do we get out of this hole? We're so deep and down into the hole to this mire uh, of, of quicksand, as it were, that when we look up, um, th- there's just a little hole and we, there's no way to make it. How do we get out of this predicament of sin and of being lost? And the word atonement is simply this, to pay the price or to offer one's self as the atonement, pay the price for those that are guilty and thereby purchasing out of that pit of slavery, slavery to sin, he purchases us out into a life of atonement. Atonement is that we, I mean, this is graphic, but I hope you never forget it. Imagine me, Jack, standing here as I am before you now, a sinner, which is not hard to imagine. That's what I am. But because I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead, the gospel message, God takes, as it were, a huge, think of a big paintbrush, and he dips that paintbrush in the blood red paint of the Lord Jesus Christ, so to speak. And he just begins to lap it upon me. He coats my arms, my head, my face, my body, and he covers me in red so that I'm standing here before you and you are sitting here before me. And those of us who trust Christ for his atonement, we are all covered in red, the blood of Christ. That's how God sees you and I. In his economy, in his holiness, he sees us red. And right here you can see by the apostles, I think, awesome heart, his passion, the pure heart of Paul. He wants his brethren to accept Christ. He wants them to know. Let's start with the word magnify. He says, I magnify my office. This is an awesome word. I magnify my ministry. The word means to offer up praise or to highly esteem. The word magnify means to glorify God with praise, with appreciation. Watch this. To be filled with exceeding thankfulness. Paul says, I am so filled right now with thankfulness and praise to God that he's called me, Paul, a Jew, to be one who preaches to the Gentiles. But oh, by the way, I want to preach to the Gentiles in such a way. Imagine Paul saying today, I want to preach to all of you at Chino Hills in such a way that if there's any Jewish people listening in, if there's any of my Jewish brethren that have come to visit, oh, I'm going to preach it straight up because I want not only Gentile, I want my Jewish brothers to come to Christ as well and experience their true and awesome uh, redemption that comes through the atonement of Christ. And he would say, and I paraphrase this in my notes. If you have my notes, it's on page three and it says, Uh, I think Paul is saying it this way. Lord, I can't believe that you have called me to do this awesome ministry. If he was speaking in our modern day tongue, that's what he would say. I I magnify uh, the ministry that God has given me. God, I can't believe I get to do what I get to do. So in all of it, he's gloriously praising Jesus and loving on God for being so kind to him and inviting him to be a minister of the gospel. And what's the intent? What should this atonement message 
effect. What's the result of preaching the gospel? And notice the word among the Jews. Paul is desiring to provoke them. And this is not the first time we've come to this word, by the way, in the book of Romans. But the word to provoke means this, to be pricked. It's funny. I still have it. You can't see it. It's too small. But I just walked by some wood and I said, I said somebody needs to um, sand this. It looks too rough. And I, crazy me, I went like this on the wood. I already, I already saw with my eyes that it was rough. I went like this. So what did I do in my brilliance? Oh, I just filled my finger with a bunch of little tiny microscopic splinters that are so tiny, but I feel them right now. I am, I am inflicting pain <laughs> in my finger right now. And I did that to myself. So listen, the word to prick or to poke, the word provoke means to be bothered or stirred or to shaken into action. You can see the word there, the definition on the screen. It means to uh, be placed in having uh, to consider Jesus, to consider Christ. The whole word implies with it that we have to uh, take up and uh, sit up and, and take notice that the message of Jesus pricks us in the heart. And that's exactly what we saw in the Gospels. And that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. And uh, this word jealousy, how, how is someone pricked in the heart? To provoke them to jealousy is to arouse them. And that jealousy, we often, as I've said in the past, the word jealousy is often viewed in a negative uh, sense. I, I, I understand that. But in this, it's the sanctified sense, to provoke them. So watch, Paul says, God's called me to reach Gentiles, but I want to reach just some of my Jewish brothers and sisters. And if I preach the gospel, it's going to prick them in the heart. And I always, oh, I hope that ha happens because if that happens, you know, it's going to be the result. They're going to get jealous for what all of you Gentiles have. <laughs> all of you in this sanctuary, in this service, all of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you had the chance to tell your Jewish friends or acquaintance about who Jesus Christ is, and you kept it biblical, my friend. There is a promised divine response that the Jew who's listening will be pricked in the heart to become jealous, to want the Jesus that you have. It's absolutely awesome. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2 says, For I am jealous, this is Paul speaking again to the believers at Corinth, for I am jealous for you with Godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you or engaged you. I have put you and Jesus into a relationship by preaching the cross, by preaching the empty tomb. I have betrothed you to one husband, that's Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That was Paul's glorious job. Listen, church family, that's my job, but that's also your job is to introduce people to Christ. And then look at the second thing under verse 15. It's this, that under the shadow of the Almighty also means this. It's not only where God desires you and I to be secure, but also this way, uh, we are secured by His love, by His love. His atonement brings to us and creates an environment by which you and I can experience God's love. And that is an awesome thing. God's love, the power of God's love. What does the Bible have to say about that? It says in verse 15, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, the bringing back together of the world, that is to God, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Wow. Reconciliation is a word that we don't often hear much in our world today unless you're in accounting. Maybe you are a bookkeeper or you're a CPA or maybe you work at a bank, or maybe you own or run a company, and your books, your numbers need to be reconciled. They need to be brought to a place of making sense. This is all correct. Everything matches up. This is what we've done. We're legitimate. And that is a tremendous fact about keeping records, keeping accounts. Well, listen how beautiful this is. The fact of the matter is, is that God's atonement works together with his love and in doing so is 
part and parcel of you and I being acceptable before Christ. We'll talk about being accepted here in a moment, but um, mark it down. To be reconciled, that Greek word means to bring back, to bring back into unity or into oneness. It's not siled, it's reconciled. This is important. This is something that once was, was lost, and now is able to be reestablished again. That is so powerful for our lives today. Always. In fact, even in our families. I mean, think about the reconciliation that needs to take place in marriages right now, or with children and their parents, or vice versa. What about the reconciliation that God wants to have happen in your life? Because God, our God, is the God of reconciliation. This is very, very vital. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, everybody, Colossians 1, verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, And by him, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. He's talking about me. I'm a big fan of this. I would take, if you have your Bible open or if you're taking notes, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, you should put your initials right there. Because God is there talking about you and I. You and I were once not reconciled. We were enemies of God. We were thinking against God. We did our own thing. It was all about us. We operated from a world of self-centeredness and selfishness. It, it, it's a world without Christ that it's the survival of the fittest, as people say. It's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's he who dies with the, no, mo, he who dies with the most toys wins. All of it's a lie. It's a lie from Satan. But Satan knows how to play off a human human depravity, and that is humans are self-centered. Somebody has once said, and it's a great, great thing. I don't know where it came from. You could look it up later, but somebody a long time ago defined Christianity this way, and I love it, that Christianity is the only religion known to be about others, to be all about others. It's a remarkable, remarkable truth. And so, listen, to be secure... Our title of this entire series, as you know, is Under the Shadow of the Almighty. So church, mark this down if you would. In Psalm chapter 17, verse 8, Psalm 17, verse 8, the Bible says, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. Think about the power of that. Psalm 17, 8. I want to read it again. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Do you know what the apple of your eye, you looked that up? It is the cornea. It's that very, very tiny, thin, very, very thin. You know that cornea that's, uh, uh, that's there on your eye is just several cells thick. I'm grateful for that. Uh, several cells thick. In other words, if your cornea gets scratched, it heals very quickly. I don't mean to gross you out about this, and it's not in my notes, but it popped into my, my head, and maybe it will be a picture for you. When we first moved to Chino Hills, there, there was hardly anything here. And we took a walk with our kids. They were, our daughters were very, very little, and I'm holding Ashley in my arms, and we're walking down our street, and it's not even lit up. And we're just walking. It's night. And I was looking down maybe talking to Lisa, I'm not sure, doesn't matter. And the moment I looked up, a pine needle went right into my left eye and right through the cornea. And I did everything I could to keep from dropping Ashley. The pain was like my brain was on fire. I couldn't believe the pain. I got her handed over to Lisa and she led me back home. I'm telling you, my entire skull my brain, my mind was, I was so tormented in pain. Called 911. They said, you've got to come down here. Uh, we had little kids. We didn't know what to do. It's, it's, now it's late. Uh, it was horrible, the pain. 
And the moment the doctor said, you've got to open up your eye because I've got to put numbing agent in it. I couldn't open my eye. My eye was gripped shut in pain because my cornea had been uh, perforated by a pine needle. And the doctor had to put the medicine and it pulled up in the corner of my eye. And he physically separated my eyelids apart. And as soon as that instantaneous, that painkiller hit my eye, they could go to work and heal me up. Oh my gosh, it was painful. It was horrific. And the Bible says right here in Psalm 17, 8, keep me as the apple of your eye. God's love for you is this way that God says, listen, don't mess with my kid. Don't offend my kid. You are my child. You have made me the Lord and Savior of your life, for so I am. And God says, I will keep you. I will answer the cry of the psalmist. I will keep you as the apple of my eye. Oh, I, will. I feel everything you feel. Such a graphic, profound depiction of that. Psalm 36, verse 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. We mentioned that verse last week and we need to hear it again. That all of us, the Bible says, God loves us. All of us, the Bible tells us, that his love is for us. But you, listen, obviously, the Bible says, listen, listen, you gotta be biblically accurate because people will say today, aren't we all gonna go to heaven because God loves us all? Nope, yes, but no. Yes, he loves us all, but not everyone's going to heaven. You said, I, th I thought he loves me. I thought he, he does love us. But listen, his love for us extended the gospel to us. But what we do with the gospel fulfills the next verse. God does love us. But the scriptures tell us he's angry with the wicked every day. Did you know that? He loves us, but he's angry with the wicked. Those of you who are parents, you can kind of relate to what I'm talking about. Also, Psalm 91, verse 1, it's actually the theme verse that we started some four studies ago, and that was this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is God's love for us. He wants us to be secure in His love. I think about what, what I call the lamentation of Jesus on the Mount of Olivet, on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he cries out. He begins, as everybody's cheering, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who, I, who were sent to her, how often I, I wanted to gather your children together. Listen, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Do you hear his heart of love? It's amazing. Behold, your house has left you desolate. For I say to you, you will see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the love of God. But listen, like in any relationship, you must accept his love. He wants you to be secure. But that's understanding that he loves you. That love of his is based on the fact that he made atonement for us. And God is absolutely desirous for you to have a relationship with him if you're a Jew or a Gentile, is regardless. Christ went to the cross for all. Yes, the gospel was preached to the Jews first and then to the Gentile, but listen to this. When I talk about the security of Christ, being under the shadow of the Almighty, that He's made atonement for you and I, that He loves you and I, this thought entered my mind and I wrote it down. Jesus wants you and I to be safe from harm. Any good parent wants their children safe from harm. Jesus wants us safe from sin, obviously. Sin is so destructive, and all of the pain and sorrow that you and I, you and I have experienced in our lives is because of the result of sin. Listen, he wants us safe from Satan. No kidding. Absolutely. He wants us safe, listen, I'm actually escalating these, in my opinion. He wants me safe from myself. See, I can get in a lot of trouble without Satan's power, 
I can get into a lot of trouble without any ambient harm around me. I can get into a lot of trouble all by myself. I think God has taken care of Satan in my life. All I need to do is use the word of God against Satan, faith, truth, right? The helmet of salvation. But the number one thing in my life is that I'm my problem. I am the one that holds me back from going deeper and further on with God. And I don't want to be like that. And then I wrote this down and it's quite shocking for a lot of people to hear. Jesus Christ being our atonement and bringing his love toward us and for us and securing us. Listen, he's also saving us from the wrath of God himself. Did you know that? The atonement of Christ in his love saves us from the wrath of Almighty God. Someone has said a long time ago, this goes back many hundreds of years ago, and it's going to raise an eyebrow or two, but it's good theology. You just never hear it anymore. When the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy that Jesus Christ is the one mediator between man and between God, the man Christ Jesus, that means that Jesus Christ, listen, died for mankind and their sins, but he also died for God and his holiness. See, so what does that mean? What do you mean? Jesus Christ, by his atonement, propelled by his love, pulls lost mankind to dead center, so to speak, and brings the righteousness of God and all of God's holy promises. And it's Jesus that fulfills the righteousness of God. And it's Jesus that answers the demand of sin and the law. And he does that all by himself. It's Christ Jesus is the answer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 tells us, Wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. By the way, a little bit of a commercial slash, it will bless your heart. If you go to Amazon Prime, I believe it is, maybe even YouTube, I'm not sure, but you can look up a, a, a documentary film titled Before the Wrath. You ought to check it out, Before the Wrath. Check that out. Now, don't laugh when you see me in it because it was a long time ago. I looked much younger, my hair was much darker, and I was probably much lighter. <laughs> um, but the film, Before the Wrath, it's very, very good. The, the Bible promises us that God will come back and remove the church from the earth before he pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting age. Why? Because he loves us. And because we're safe in him, listen to this wonderful truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I love the way that sounds. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us, there's that word, to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, here we go, application time, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, that's what Paul was desiring to do. Paul was desiring to be used as a minister of reconciliation to not only the Gentile world, but to his own brethren, the Jews. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Christian, listen, you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but it is true. If God has forgiven you, if you are aware of how much of a wretch you and I were before Christ, and he saved you, he washed you clean, he gave you a new life, you can name the name of Jesus, you know who he is, guess what? God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. Christian home, at least it's, look, at least it says it's a Christian home, it's got an address, it's got a roof. Husband and wife claim to know Jesus, they say they're Christians. Did you know that in that home, it is the will of God that that home be reconciled? Isn't it interesting that as I say that, the man who has all these reasons as to, and maybe, listen, he may even have legitimate biblical reasons why 
he should divorce his wife. Maybe she's been unfaithful. Those, there's legitimate grounds for him to divorce her. But what's the better thing to do? The better thing to do is to be reconciled or vice versa. What if he's cheated on you? What's, listen, first of all, either case, know this, the kids are rooting for your reconciliation. They're kind of like, they're kind of like God, aren't they? They want you guys to make up, make it work, come to the church, get some biblical counseling, get some help, know how to read the scriptures together, know how to wash one another's feet, know how to pray for one another. And watch the, watch the division begin to dissipate. Be reconciled together. I did a wedding one time. Uh, it, I, I forget what culture it was, but both of them were believers, but they were from a Polynesian type culture. And in the service, part of the tradition of that culture was me taking the hands of the husband to be and the wife to be, and I brought them together and they, I had this very amazing rope, a uh, beautiful velvety type rope, and I tied their hands together in the service, and in that, they are symbolized as being one. If your hands are tied together, it's kind of hard to throw the first or the last punch, isn't it? Think about that. I don't mean that physically. I would hope that's not the issue, but maybe it is. But the Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He wants you to reconcile. Make your marriage work. Make your family work. Maybe you're hearing this today and God is saying, you're my child. I reconciled you to me by the blood of my cross. Now I'm asking you to go make up with your dad. Go make up with your mom. Go make up with your kids. Because God has given the Christian the supernatural power to do that. And then listen, also under this, we see in verse 16 that we're secured by his holiness. The holiness of God. I wish we had time to get into this, but um, the holiness of God. Sometimes we have a, a thought that holiness is something that is so abstract that we can never relate to it. But I think God has given us some things to jar our um, imagination and to grab our attention, the holiness of God. Um, waves, great waves breaking at this at the shore and, and causing the ground to shake, I think of God's holiness. A storm, lightning, thunder, the crash of it all, I think of God's holiness. I don't know why, it's just always affected me that way. Sometimes you see awesome clouds rolling by against a blue background and the sun is hitting them in such a way that there's that proverbial silver lining and you look and I think about the holiness of God and he's pure. The Bible says his eyes are too pure to behold evil. That's why, listen, I believe that when the sky turned black there in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified from noon to three, the Bible says for those three hours, the whole sky, the whole realm turned black. There was a great darkness, it said, that fell. And I wonder if that was a symbolic display of God, the Father, turning His eyes, as it were, away from His Son, Jesus, as all of the sin of mankind was heaped upon Jesus. I wonder if God just didn't use the celestial elements to black out the light, to communicate. Even nature, as it were, was disgusted by the sins of Jack and by the sins of all of us. But Christ paid the price for all of that. It says in verse 16, for if the first fruits is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And the first fruits is uh, the fact that from Israel, those who believe, those who would believe. And this is a, this is a term used in not only farming and harvesting, in planting, but most importantly, it's right out of the scriptures. The first fruits, there's the feast of first fruits, which is one of the seven feasts of Moses that is to be um, adhered to and studied among the Jewish people. If you're a note taker, write this down. You can look at it in detail. Exodus chapter 23 talks about the feast of first fruits. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 23. 
Isaiah, I'll repeat it in a moment. Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 65. That's Exodus chapter 23, Deuteronomy chapter 26, Leviticus chapter 23, Isaiah chapter 43, and Isaiah chapter 65 all talk about the holiness of God in relation to Him being honored with what is known as the first fruits. Out of your harvest, so to speak, of either vineyard, the wine grapes, or the, the, the cattle, the barley, the, the wheat, whatever it is. In our world, whatever it is for us. For us, it's paychecks. The, the way that we're paid. There's a portion of that that's top, that goes to God first. When Lisa and I were first married, I lost an incredibly well-paying job <laughs> because, uh, frankly, I, I did the right thing and uh, didn't go over well. So I lost that job. The guy didn't want me working for him. Uh, be that as it may, um, I was reduced from making this incredible annual salary down to being paid by the hour. And yet we got married. I mean, we were married. And so do you know what we did? Because we understand this, we would take our little checks that we would get. Lisa and I would sit at our table. And I, by the way, I made the table. We'd sit at the table. And we would open up our checks. And we would combine the, that amount and write a tithe check to the Lord. And then from there, we would make our, we would pay our bills. Whatever we had left. Why? Because God's holy. And he's to receive from us our first fruits the first production of life from our hands, whatever that may be. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 16 begins by saying, and uh, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ is not raised from the dead, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, listen to this, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Wow. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been risen or has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. Jesus is the first fruits. One more verse for you on this one. That's not true. We have a few more verses on this one. This is so awesome. It's Romans 8, verse 23, that begins there by saying, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. That means nature is suffering because of fallen man. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, that's new life in Christ, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. Listen, that is the redemption of our bodies. We, listen, we, for we were saved in this hope. Being saved in this hope is being saved in this beautiful, happy, coming reality is that ultimately God's holiness will swallow us up in resurrection from the dead. Holiness, God is holy. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, the Bible says, listen, oh my goodness, listen to this. Leviticus 20, verse 26, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. I have separated you from the nations that you should be mine. Write this down. That's Leviticus 20, verse 26, and write this down next to it. 1 Peter 1, 15, and I'll explain. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. As he called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. First of all, let's define the word holy, and then let's go in for the punch, okay? The definition of the word holy. In fact, in one of the services last week, I mentioned the word hagios. I don't think I said it in all the services, but in one of them, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating for whatever service that was, H-A-G-I-O-S is the word hegios, and it is the Greek word for holy or holiness, holy. And um, we would get the word saint from that word. Saint Mike, Saint Karen, Saint Jack, Saint Fred, Saint Barney, Saint Wilma and Betty. If you're trusting Christ, you are 
declared by God in His atoning work, right? In His love and His holiness, a saint. And so that word means to be declared or made sacred. He has set you apart. He has pulled you out from the world and He has set you apart. That makes you holy. You right now are holy. You say, well, uh, are you sure? My priest didn't say I was. God says you are if you are covered in the atonement of Christ. My friend, listen. And so that word means pure. You ever think yourself as being pure? Gosh, you know what? Please listen. Wow. <laughs> listen to this. God sees you through Christ as pure. You need to meditate on that. That might change your conduct if God sees you. If you realize that God sees you like that, you are pure. What are you doing there? You're pure and untainted, declared by God. You trust Christ. Why are you saying that? Why are you looking at that? Why are you doing those things? Get out of there. <laughs> Man, I feel like a dad, a pastor. I feel like a friend reaching in and grabbing you by the ear and pulling you away from that thing that's harming you. What are you doing, I would say? Get out of there. Don't you know who you are? You're a child of the living God for crying out loud. God declared you holiness or holy because of the work of Christ, because God himself is holy. And when it says, you be holy for I, the Lord, am holy, how do you hear that? Is this how you hear it? Be holy, because I'm holy. Is that how you hear it? Or do you hear it like this? I'm God, I'm holy, so you can go be holy. Big difference. Our salvation starts in him, not in us. If you think your salvation and your atonement and your holiness and your love and all the thing about you is based on you, then listen, this is how you hear it. Be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. That's very depressing. But you see, I get to be holy because he's holy. Christ saved me and he imparted this to me and to you. So we get to live our Christian life. Listen, when God says, you shall not do that. Do you pout about it? Do you kick the can and get upset and slam the door? How about this? Focus on this. Instead of the shalt nots, it's thou gets to. You and I gets to do this and you and I gets to do that because now we've been freed from sin pulling us around. And then listen, number five, the fifth argument in our series is this, verses 17 to 18. It is where God desires you and I to be at rest. Shabbat, the rest of God. And we can rest because, listen, you've been grafted in. Verse 17 says, For if some of the branches were broken off, so if some of the Jews didn't believe and they were broken off, and you, that's the Gentile, being a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, pause right there. What is this grafting in? You and I can rest in the Lord Jesus Christ because you, in your belief in Him, because He has gifted you by His grace, you've exercised your faith, you've trusted Him, you've been grafted into the body of Christ. The, the word grafting, and I'm going to read something to you in a moment. It's very fine print. Maybe it's going to be nice and good on the screens for you. But grafted, listen, the word means to be placed into, grafted. I think you guys know that, but hopefully it becomes more uh, picturesque to you, maybe more technicolor. Watch. To be placed into, inserted, to be applied or to be put into the place. It is a divine act of pure grace is what's implied in the context. So listen to this. And I'm reading now. In fact, I'm reading Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, as you can see on the screens. At the close of the last century, a great infestation upon the French vineyards practically destroyed all the grape industry, including the famed French wines. The vine industry of France was saved only because a stronger, more resilient vine root was known to exist in California. By the way, this is like, eight, I forget, like 1899 or something like that, way back. The California vines are immune 
to what is called phylaxera, if I'm saying that correct. Phylaxera. They were brought in, that is from California, and the scions of the famed French vines were grafted into the California vine. It is a well-known fact that today there is scarcely a grapevine in all of France that does not carry within it a California root. The best authorities state simply that they do not have any answers to the question. Where or how can the grafting be detected by observation? The double growth of the two vines having fused into a mass so continuous that the precise location of the point of grafting is impossible to determine even with the aid of a microscope, close quote. Wow! So something good can come out of California. What a beautiful picture. Do you see, listen, do you see Israel? And do you see the church? And God's great salvation? The message went out to Israel first. Listen, they are the root. But because of unbelief, they withered. And some of the branches were cut off. But not all of Israel was lost. There was a remnant. And then God brings alongside the hearing of the gospel to this wild olive and grafted in among. And it brought new life into the dying old root, as it were. And the welding of it. Why is... Why, Israel and the church, how can it be so weldedly, beautifully, strongly assimilated together? Listen, one does not replace the other, nor does one cancel the other out. There is the strength of them coming together. What brings them together? It is the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit that bonds them together. And we can rest in that grafting. Don't look at the Jew and say, well, too bad. You lost out. Shame on you. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't be like that. In fact, listen to this. Again, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse says, is incalculable harm has been done by those who have attempted to apply our text primarily to individuals. An individual who is once grafted into Christ by faith can never be broken off from Christ. Wow. John chapter 10, verse 28. I'm going to hurry up now. We're running out of time. What's new, right? John chapter 10, verse 28. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Think of the grafting. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8. Am I going too fast? If I'm going too fast, um, I have to go too fast because I'm not going to finish this. And I'm going to finish this. Romans 8, 37. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, <sighs> the election results, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, including me, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and all God's people said? Absolutely. And then the next thing in verse 17, we see that we can rest because you and I have received new life. We've got a brand new life, friends. Absolutely awesome. In verse 17, it goes on and it says, and with them, that is with Israel, that's us, with them, became a partaker, that's the key word, of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Here's some technical things for you. Partaker, circle the word. It means to come into being. It means to have happened or to have uh, been done, uh, to be made the same. So watch this. And with them, we, right, us, them, became partakers. One, welded, fused together of the root and fatness of the, olive tree, uh, of the olive tree. What a glorious fact that is. I'm going to give you a string of verses before we land this thing, everybody. John chapter 3, verse 15. Whoever, whoever, Jesus said. Whoever. What, who's a whoever? 
Listen, are you a Muslim right now watching this and you've never heard this before? Of course not, because it's not in the Quran. It's only in the Bible. And you love what you're hearing. You can be a whosoever. Are you an atheist, but you like what you're hearing? You can be a whosoever. Listen, are you a religious Christian and you've never appreciated or known this before? Well, you can become a whosoever. Are you a Jew? We plead with you, become a whosoever. Because in John 3, Jesus was speaking to the Jews regarding this doctrine. To the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Wow. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. 1 John 5, 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. One more verse here. John 4, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said to her, this is the woman at the well in Samaria. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Have you ever tried all religions of the world and you're still thirsty? But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's what Jesus gives. You know what? All of us, we, I, we all have a lot of needs. We have a lot of wants. We're humans. But I can tell you this. I'm 100% satisfied. Many of you in this auditorium today, in sanctuary, you can say the same thing. You'd like to have that. You'd like to have this or the other thing. But if it doesn't happen, I'm 100% satisfied. Why? Because this world is perishing. Whatever we get, it's going to burn or rust. And we can't take it to heaven with us but we are going to heaven based upon what Christ has done for us. And we rest under the shadow of the Almighty. And it's because we've received the new life. And listen, mark it down. Finally, it's because you're saved by grace, the grace of God, friends. Grace. Grace is what God gives. No man can, no man can get it unless God gives it. You can't buy it. You can't be cute enough to get it. You can't be old enough or young enough. You cannot be accomplished enough. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense was the acronym grace that Hal Lindsey gave. God's riches at Christ's expense. What a great definition, and it's true. Verse 18, but do not boast against the branch. But if you do boast, remember, key word, this is the word, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And that word remember means to consider. Consider, to be mindful, to call to mind, to bring it up. Remember this. Bring it up to your mind, friend. Don't get all cocky. Don't get all arrogant. Isn't that a weird thing? Think about a Christian being arrogant. What a, what a weird thing that is. Think about a pastor or a, a priest or a Christian or... Oh, it's gross to think them being conceited. That's a sick thought, isn't it? What are you conceited about? Oh, I'm, I'm God's servant. Well, Adam, I don't know about that. I don't think God's servants talk like that. Oh, look at me. I'm the great reverend, right holiness, pastor, priest, pontiff, evangelist, apostle. Oh, stop. That's so ridiculous. Listen, if God is using you, you should be humbled because you should be in shock because that's how grace moves. That's how grace moves. But we can rest in God's grace. The Bible tells us in Romans here, chapter 11, verse 18, in the New Living Translation. It's a translation. Listen to this. But you must not brag about being grafted into replace the branches that were cut off, you are just a branch, not the root. <laughs> and that may be simple, but that is accurate. Friends, listen, we're going to bring this to a conclusion, but please consider this. The Bible says, Paul writing to those that were in Asia Minor, Ephesus, Turkey today, 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and, and listen. In fact, you guys can all stand up. You can stand. It doesn't mean leave, please. Just don't leave. Just stand. And let this truth impact you. Let this truth wash over you. Ephesians 2, verse 5. For even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with, uh, with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The faith is not even of you. It's a gift given by God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. <laughs> for we are his workmanship. Do you love that? I love it. Are you in a cult right now? Are you a Mormon? I love Mormons, but they're, they're lost. They need Jesus and Jesus only, not works. Are you a Muslim? I know many Muslims. You're trying to work your way into heaven. Even my, my friends that are practicing Judaism, they're basing their salvation on works. The Bible says no way. No. It's by God's grace and it's His work. For we are His workmanship. So here we go. I'm going to shoot this at you. Genesis 49 verse 10 tells us that the Messiah had to be the one from the tribe of Judah. So what are you going to do about this Jesus? My Jewish friends, what are you going to do about your Yeshua? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16 tells us that the Messiah has to be the descendant of King David. What are you going to do about that? Micah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says that the Messiah of Israel has to be born in Bethlehem. But what are you going to do with that? Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27 tells us that the Messiah would arrive before the destruction of the temple. Did you know that? What about Zechariah 9, 9? We talked about it last week, that the Messiah has to come to Jerusalem as king riding on the back of a baby donkey. Did that ever happen? What about Psalm 22, verse 1 to 31, where there it says that the Messiah would be tortured at the hands of his uh, critics and that he would be crucified through his hands and his feet and that his back would be laid wide open. Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 tells us that the Messiah would uh, match all of these particular descriptions about him suffering. He would be silent. He wouldn't he would be silent. He wouldn't try to defend himself. He would be arrested, put through a mock trial, that he would be beaten, that he would be put to death, and he would have to be buried in a rich man's tomb. All that is from Isaiah 52 and 53. What about Genesis 3:15, That the Messiah of Israel and the world alone would have to come from God himself to be the savior of mankind. Genesis 3:15. What about Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14? That the Messiah had to be born of a virgin. Think about that. What about Isaiah chapter 35? verses 5 and 6, where the Messiah would appear and open the eyes of the blind, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and proclaim the gospel as the kingdom of God. Isaiah 35. What about Deuteronomy? We're almost done. What about Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, that tells us that the Messiah would be the salvation of the Jew and Gentile by the Abrahamic covenant? Because remember, my friends, the first Jew was a Gentile before he was the first Jew. Abraham. Almost done. Isaiah 26, verses 19 to 21 tells us that the Messiah would have to return as the Lord, Jesus Christ. Think of that. He will return for his people. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7 says that the Messiah would return and reign upon the earth for a thousand years. And finally this, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4 says that the Messiah would be the eternal Son of God, and you should know him by name. And here it is. Look at it on the screens. Let it take your breath away. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you pray with me right now? Will you pray this? Dear God in heaven, I see 
scriptures and challenges that I have no answer to unless I submit to the word of God. I see these arguments that prove that Jesus is the Lord, that you love me, that he is my atonement, and that it's all by grace, and that I am humbly asking you to graft me into the commonwealth of Israel, as the Bible puts it. Jew, Gentile alike, we come and we say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I proclaim you the resurrected Savior, my Lord, and I accept you as my atonement, as my redeemer. Thank you for loving me. I give you my life today. Heal my family. Heal my world that I'm involved in by first starting now with me. Heal me by washing away my sins. Dear God, give me a new life. Make me a new creation. Thank you for being the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, God bless you guys. I will see you Wednesday night back here. God bless you guys. Stand strong and vote, vote, vote your biblical worldview values. Get out there and vote for the preservation of the unborn child. Vote for borders. Vote for Israel. Vote for our Constitution. Vote for truth. Vote for freedom. Let's keep praying. God bless you.